This is John Spencer, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Yeah, thanks, everybody, for tuning in tonight. It's awesome to get John on the show. You and I go back. And gosh, now, it's, it's a number of years now that we have yeah. been able to interact. You've been on my show a bunch of times, and I always appreciate, uh, well, I've always appreciated when you're on, but, oh, my gosh, you have exploded in terms of influence, and uh, that has got to be for you uh, an insane ride. I mean, you always did great work, but there's mastery, and then there's, like influence, right? And you've had mastery for a long time, but now, wow. Well, I mean, so I really appreciate that, Pete. And and I think that since we've been talking, like I learned from you, mm. um, and this is a you know a, a, a lifelong learning process. I've just had the immense privilege to have a job where I can focus on one topic, unlike a PhD, even narrowly. I like I have no bounds to studying cities. Um, do what type of warfare in cities, but I've learned since we started talking, you know, I'm not that same person. I've learned so much more. Um, yeah. Even after I retired from service and, and started traveling the world and going to these places um, where I used to go to battles right after they ended, like Nagorno-Karabakh or in Ukraine. But now I'm going into battles as they're happening and trying to, to gather lessons. Um, but I, but I really appreciate that. And you know, like you said, and I really appreciated all the kind words with your last show with Jeff, um, a good friend of mine. Uh, and um, the fact that, you know, people are, are listening now because people are seeing like what we were talking about in the past. Of, you know, don't get comfortable. Uh, you can avoid urban. You might not have an interest in urban warfare, but it has an interest in you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so I want to cover this. I thought we we're going to start somewhere else, but since we've we talked about some of the exchanges we've had, we recently, uh, we, I think you had posted something and then I made a comment on it, but I, I think this goes to one of the things I've discovered in my time in combat is like the transparency that's required to communicate clearly what's going on. Because if you don't do that, then the narrative belongs to whomever uh, takes that initiative. Right. And so that, that narrative issue has been obviously a big thing here. We had uh, you were talking about the aerostat and looking into um, Lebanon, right? And I said, you know, the, part of the ground truth problem is is that you don't control what that message from that aerostat being up there is, and and this kind of breaks our commander brain. But the reality is, is Lebanon can say or Hezbollah can say anything they want about that, and any farmer, any businessman looks up and they're like, that thing is doing this evil thing. And, and look, there's some classified things that happen with with the monitoring, but. But by simply, possibly, this is a possible solution, by showing people what this thing does and being transparent about, this is a camera platform. It's not a weapons platform. It's not, is it, this really happened in Afghanistan. Aerostat's flying. I'm talking to the farmers. A, a buddy of mine had told me about this. And the farmers would look at the Aerostat. And by the, by the way, everybody, Aerostat is a blimp with, with cameras on it. Um, they're like, that thing has x-ray vision, and it's looking at our naked wives. And if you're a commander and I tell you that, you're like, that's not true. And I'm like, it doesn't matter, man. It, it, what matters is, is how that impacts your, are you, are you winning or losing right now with that message out there? Right. And so it requires a lot of us to kind of put all of our expertise in this bucket and say, have we considered this part of it? How do we deal with this? Does this apply here? And it's, it's very complex. So I wanted you to talk about that, but also how do you sort all that complexity out? I mean, I'm still figuring that out, Pete. I, I think that example, <laughs> I think that example, one of the problems with modern war, let's say either Ukraine or, or Gaza, is that wars, the veil between war and the global community is gone. So it isn't that farmer's perception of what that is. It's now the globe's per perception of what that is or what you did. Boy, that's smart. Um, yeah. Yeah, the sensor... The ubiquitous sensor and immediate connection. Unlike we've been saying that for decades, you know, I, I, you know, in the Pentagon, we would talk about this and the, the evolution of the information domain, all this stuff. But we're we're in it. We're not in the future of it. We're in it, where all the different sensors in urban environments, um, you know, thanks to Elon with low orbit civilian satellites, um, you know, pushing internet to parts of the globe that has never been uh, ubiquitous. Uh, connectivity with in war with the you know all the tools that all militaries and societies used to use to influence 
they call it influence operations. Now it can be used for extreme control of the narrative. You used to fight the narrative. Like if you don't want to fight in the narrative, you're going to lose. But we're in a new age where that ubiquitous center and ability to get a message out faster, right? Like, you know, the Churchill thing, like, you know, Elias traveled around the world twice before truth has had his time to put his pants on. Um, yeah. it, we're living it. And they were talking about it back then, you know, with yeah. telegraphs and stuff. We're living it now to where literally um, X or whatever can spread. And it's not informed understanding. Like you said, like it's the entire world, billions of people looking into war through a soda straw going, oh, I know what's happening. You don't have a clue what that that is, but you just you believe, you know, with issues with societies and critical thinking that, you know, for a fact, or you're listening to some anonymous experts who's telling you. Um, and there's been so many examples just in this short amount of time in the war in Gaza where it's like daily like this happened. The world thinks this is what what it was. Yeah, boy, you could say that whole part again, especially about. There's a lot of people that make a lot of money talking about a lot of shit they don't have any real knowledge about. I mean, yeah. that's just the truth. <laughs> and when you, I, here's the thing is like, because I know you and because we have that warrior thing that we share, if you go somewhere and you say you saw something, I have, I have faith in that because you're not on a side. You're there to learn. You're there to understand. And that's my role, right? Well, I'm going there, like, I don't care how many people you've murdered. I don't care if you're a warlord. I don't care if you're dealing drugs. I'm just here to understand. Right. And if I can, if I can balance that scale out where I can reduce threat in an area or make a dangerous person my friend, that means I got to talk to dangerous people. That means you got to go to dangerous places so we can try to communicate this back. But that rejection of expertise, that rejection of reality, man, it uh, it's disheartening. Yeah, and I'm not an expert in everything. I never claimed to be. Right. I, you know, I, I've been studying urban combat for a little while. I think I got a. I know a lot. Um, but I'm also a constant learner. I'm not set on my, and I've gone, and every time I've gone to Gaza now, twice since the war, I've had my mind blown on like, dang, I, I couldn't have imagined that either the enemy or um, what the IDF are doing. But I mean, this gets to like meta thinking, like the way I see things is because of what I know, what I've, uh, I've studied. You, you talked about mastery. You know, the fact that I taught strategy at West Point helps me understand that yeah, I can tell people what's happening, but I know for a fact that it's the perception of what happens, that the war is politics. And it does matter if the world thinks something's happening, even when it's not. And they, and they use now numbers, like all kinds of crazy stuff. I know enough about teaching strategy that in war, it is a contest of wills. And will is heavily influenced by what they think is happening, perceptions. And I've heard some very smart people say some really dumb things. Because they're you know, overreaching on what they think they're seeing in a very unique setting of war. Even if they're you know, 40 years in combat, I don't, I don't care. Um, yeah. This is a very, you know, in every case, like um, there's so much war going on, unfortunately, that anybody can do confirmation bias. Go, look, I told you so. Drones. I told you so. You know, civilian casualties. They're doing you know, all these things. Um, but like you said, there are a lot of people who really have no expertise, but all of a sudden um, they become experts in saying what all other experts don't. And because war is uncertain, they actually have what we call a clause of this, you know, roll of the dice, uh, the grim roll of the dice chance to be right. So then they get, mm -hmm. they get a massive following because war is, it is uncertainty. And if, if you, you know, if I try to make a informed and, you know, a, because somebody pushes you like, what's going to happen? When's this going to happen? When is this battle going to be over? But it's a grim roll of the dice because war is human. War is political. You can't, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow in all actuality, in the actual context of the war, the, you know, all the different variables. So you get all these quacks, literally quacks. Some of them relying on some amount of experience who, are literally making a living by saying the opposite of the entire expert community of whether it's military strategy, geopolitics, whatever. They're just a radical that somebody can go, look, he's saying this, 
And then he, he actually has a chance to be correct because of the uncertainty of war. Yeah, boy. And all the, uh, it makes me think of all the references on the body count, you know, and you and I both know that there's battles from a hundred years ago. They're like, eh, 30,000, maybe a hundred thousand. Like you just, 70 years ago. it is so hard to pin anything on any kind of number, especially now in the middle of the fog of war. Yeah. You, Pete, you know how many civilians died in the 1950 battle, the second battle of Seoul? You know, during oh the greatest, God. you know, the greatest military maneuver of modern history, the Incheon landing, and then the drive to Seoul to take it back from the North Koreans. You know how many civilians died in that battle? No. Me either. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's no, I can't find a record literally in yeah. the history to include in like command historians, right? I, I'm digging yeah. But there is no record of how many civilians died, and we believe it's a lot. Like, I can tell you that, you know, 100,000 died in the Battle of Manila, and, and you probably heard me talking about that. Mm -hmm. um, but in, you know, after the Geneva Convention, because somebody could say, like, well, that's, you know, that was, you know, during like carpet bombing, uh, the fire bombing of Tokyo. Like, but the Geneva Conventions were to address that, like, well, 1950, the Korean War, you know, million South Koreans died. But nobody can say in that battle, which was a contested urban battle, my field of study, I'm digging like, well, how, it's not known. There's a there's a bunch of reasons why. But, yeah, the body count thing, as you know, as a student of war, is always complicated. And I've never seen a war, and I'm sure you haven't either, where we trust, one, where anybody has a ru running count of how many civilians are dying in the battle to the single digit and it's the enemy inside the battle area whose number that the entire world believes. Yeah, yeah, boy. You could again, you could say that again too. Like uh, when we invaded Iraq the second time, we don't know how many Iraqis got killed. We just, we just don't know. And and frankly, no one wants to count because that number is not going to be small. It's going to be huge, you know. No, but or even um, yeah, go ahead. But even that. Right. So I, I was a part of the invasion. Right. I was I jumped into yeah. northern Iraq. Um, you know, I've, I've interviewed um, people that were in the drive to Baghdad and the Battle of Baghdad. I've interviewed people who was in the Second Battle of Fallujah um, in the invasion of Iraq. The enemy didn't do didn't defend its cities. It was dumb and stood in the open. Um, it was it didn't defend Baghdad at, at a scale that would have seen a massive amount of destruction. In But we did not. In, like you said, but you said it could have led to a lot of civilian casualties because we did not evacuate the cities. We used our overwhelming speed, um, a coup de main, you know, you take out the regime maneuver that is very typical in wars and these contested urban battles, right, where an enemy. Yeah embeds themselves in the terrain, cannot be convinced to surrender, right? We we even got ISIS to leave cities, like to like to, to make an internal call. Do I want to die in this city? Do I want to die later? And they literally evacuated in 2016, 17, like in the in a couple of cities where we let them leave the cities because that's that leads to less urban battles. But when you have an enemy defender like the Japanese in World War II, like Hamas, who will not leave the urban areas or ISIS, um, there's nobody who can say, and this is kind of my current line of research is that you think there's an alternative. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you look at the Geneva convention and what the rules of war are, uh, what do you do when someone's not going to play by those rules? You still follow them. That that's, that's the way you, that's the way we fight. That, you know, that's, yeah. um, that is inherent in the law actually is it doesn't matter if the other side's following the law or not. I mean, it does matter. I mean, the fact that Russia doesn't follow not just the Geneva Conventions, it doesn't follow even international law on what is authorized to start a war, right? It, they started a war of aggression against the UN Charter. Like the entire reason that the United Nations is there is to prevent what Russia did. It's all debatable, right? But they and also don't follow the laws of rule. There's an ICC, an actual war crimes arrest warrant for Putin right now. But when you fight a combatant on the field of battle, who isn't following the laws of war, it doesn't change who we are, whether we're American, Israeli, you know, British, whatever. We follow the laws of war. We signed up to say we will follow them. And that leads to 
holding the moral high ground, right? One, it's who we are. You hold the moral high ground, which leads to political, right? Which gets to the politics of your, your strength is not just your military power, it's your allies. And if you're, you know, an evil, tyrannical regime, you're, you have few allies. And, and that's the case of the history of war as well. If you have more allies, you're a just cause, you follow the laws, you, you follow a human approach to war, despite war is death, war is killing and destruction. You follow the laws of war because that's who you are. Is Israel signed on to the Geneva Convention or have, I don't know if they've done that. So it's complicated, right? There's different. <laughs> I love it. There's different conventions. Like they're not, they're not signatories to the, the Geneva Convention about the, you know, the ICC and the ICJ, right? And neither we are, are we. The United States is not a member uh, of signatories because we haven't, there are reasons why we wouldn't sign up to that and say that our soldiers can be held to account to the United Nations versus our own internal system, because we're a professional military that holds our own soldiers accountable, which you know in Afghanistan and Iraq became an issue as people accused us of war crimes. Now, all the same people that are currently accusing the IDF of war crimes accused us, right? There are 84 war crimes cases against the US military in the Second Battle of Fallujah, and it took years for the people that investigate, actual not experts, who looked for evidence, who found, who said every claim, there was no evidence to support them. But the same ones in you know, Air Wars, ICRC, uh, all of these people were accusing the U.S. military in every battle that we've partaken in, that we're indiscriminate, that we violate the laws of war, that we did war crimes. But they never reached the level, although the first battle of Fallujah we could talk about, they never reached a level like this, where the entire mm -hmm. world is saying, you must stop. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care that you've you've brought the level of civilian harm in an urban combat to the lowest in history. I don't care. I don't care. It, we believe it's too much. Like, what's too much? I don't know, but you're you're doing it. It's too much. It's gotten to the level of having significant impacts on the entire ability to even defend yourself as a nation because – and I've been seeing this bill. We've been talking for years. So I've been a part of the United Nations conversations about limiting um, destruction in urban combat. There are groups who are, there's like a hundred countries who have signed a political declaration who says that they won't use missiles, bombs, artillery, mortars, and urban combat. I've presented at those conventions or those discussions going, that's a really bad ideal. And this is, um, there's a really famous quote from a guy who, you know, I'm a student of strategy a guy named Colin Gray saying across the history of war, those who have tried to limit and address a, a collateral aspect of war have historically empirically led to more destruction. Yeah, boy, that's okay. I, I want to get back into this, but I want to go back up a little bit. In the conversation is because uh, Palestine is not a state. To, to most of the world, not even to the UN. How does that apply? I mean, is this just an upright? Like, how do they sort that? Do you, do you even know? I mean, it is it is a confusing legal problem, right? Because it's like if you had a fight in Kurdistan. Well, it's not really a Kurdistan. So, you know, what kind of fight is this? Are, are they actually fighting? I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's such a weird thing. So legally, how does that work into the mix? Because there isn't yeah, an That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm a urban warfare student scholar uh, but i've yeah. had to because of that because in the urban terrain unlike any other environment on the planet there are more restrictions on the use of force and the laws of war right so that you can't you know tar protected populations protected objects all of this stuff in that aspect of who the combatant is determines whether it's an internationally armed conflict or non-internationally armed conflict which would include you know non-state actors and things like that so the law does account for that but this is the major problem where, again, the world has lost its mind, is that, yes, Hamas is a terrorist. It's a terrorist organization designated by the United States, United Kingdom, and many other countries. They are terrorists by definition. But they also had a de facto state. They had a, that Gaza was a de facto territory that they controlled politically, economically. And, yes, Israel prevented them from having an air force, a Navy, um, things that they would use by their charter and by their 
words to destroy Israel, but by de facto, they had a massive military. One, they were the ruling authority of an autonomous area. They had a massive military of over 30,000 fighters, 30 battalions, over 15,000 short range to long range missiles, you know, a, a, an underground complex of over 400 miles of deep buried military um, bunkers that no military munition can, can reach. They were a, as close to a state without being a state as you can get. So when you talk about going to war against one, they invaded Israel. Like that's why not a terrorist attack. Yes, they were terrorists, but they invaded air, Israel with over a division level of forces. If you count the three waves of over 4,000 Palestinian people of Gaza that included designated terrorists. So, so you're a combatant in that aspect, although they're illegal combatants. Um, if you're a member of Hamas, 4,000 crossed the border and committed vile atrocities um, in, in multiple waves. But you got to count the people who were launching the 4,000 rockets. So over a division of forces attacked Israel and invaded it. And Israel, in accordance with the UN Charter, declared war against that organization, Hamas, who celebrated and took full credit for their actions, um, and then waged war to achieve the destruction of that force in that territory. It gets complicated legally, like you said, when when you have when you're basically fighting a military that is also an illegal combatant. So it's really right. a non in you know a, a non armed international conflict. Um, which gets into like the legality of whether it's a prisoner of war, is it a, a, a you know, a, you know, all of it, there are differences, but the law accounts for all this. It isn't a problem of the law of war, but we've entered this world in where everybody's an interpreter of the law of war and they do what's called effects based condemnation. So, like, even you, I know you know a lot about the laws of war. You're not going to look at something on TV and screen and go, well, that's clearly a war crime. Look how much destruction. Right. That they clearly did that on purpose, and that's a war crime. Like that's ridiculous. It's not even how the law of war works, you know, with a proportionality assessment, with intent, like the whole, which is really um, probably one of the most disgusting things that I've ever seen in my studies, is the 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 word that was created to describe the Holocaust, genocide. It was created yeah. to dis was being used in a situation where I know from a fact being on the ground, they are doing everything they physically can to limit civilian casualties. So no intent to target. And actually it was, I don't know if you heard it today, you know, I've been saying it, but I don't know if you heard it today, but the um, Admiral Kirby, uh, you know, the spokesman for the, the administration said, there has been zero evidence to date, six months later of the IDF based on our investigations targeting civilians. So just by that fact, According to the United States, there is zero evidence of genocidal intent. I know it's complicated. There are other um, criteria on genocidal, basically, you know, to say there's a genocide, but I think it's disgusting to even, you know, based on the facts on the ground, um, yeah. to, to, to go down that route. Well, you probably heard Jeff Fisher and I talked the other day. I, I liken war to a dragon, and that you just, once you let that thing out, it just consumes whatever it wants. I, yeah. I, I, I heard you say it. I didn't really get it, uh, but I heard the dragon. I heard about the dragon. Yeah, well, and the idea is like once you start a war, it's almost like a nuclear weapon, right? You you, you can go, okay, you, you set it off, but you don't control the aftermath, right? And so this dragon just goes, runs free everywhere, and it, it just consumes whatever. It, and it's grisly. It's, war is terrible. War is and, hell. Uh, babies, wow. yeah. But I don't think it's, so, it's not controllable. Yeah. So this is the idea of what would America do? Right. Okay. What well, what would America with a massive, not unlimited, massive military power, if somebody crossed our border in yeah. a division and level attack, you know, raped, burned children, uh, you know, took 200, you know, I'm not even going to do the, the, the quantity, the whole, like, right. you know, 29 11s in one day. But if they did that and then retreated back into their territory, wherever that is, what would America do? And it would look, I'm telling you, with strong confidence in studying American military history, that it would look a lot different than the way the IDF have done it. Mm. How so? I mean, starting with the rockets. So 4,000 rockets on day one. Yeah. Um, you know, we would have one of the world's greatest 
the the world's greatest air power in the sky in multiple levels dropping bombs until every rocket stopped emanating out of the enemy territory and it would be proportional because the definition yeah. of proportion is to use the appropriate amount of force to remove the threat and do the calculations but you can we would we would make sure a single rocket and for for months rockets were still emanating out of gaza a lot of those got shot down a lot of those 10 percent of those so 10 percent of 10 000 or twelve thousand rockets in Hamas landed inside of gaza and killed palestinians which are a part of that mm. body count but right. not all of them were shot down i was actually in gaza in december in a hamas tunnel and they had launched a rocket and hit tel aviv right off the beach from which my hotel was sitting wow yeah that's crazy going back to the uh the damage and the civilian casualties and the, the the damage to property you know sherman boy he still continues to be right in terms of <laughs> shut up i would say because you know uh, again i mean sherman was pre uh, pre convinced the geneva conventions for sure yeah but sherman, i mean that, i mean that whole thing that you know war is a contest of will but we we have decided as a world those of us who actually follow the laws that we're not going to do that. We're not going to punish. Right. It's actually a war crime. It's called collective punishment. <laughs> and Sherman by definition was doing collective punishment, make them hurt so much of war that they never want to see it again. And they, they surrender. Yeah. But I mean, that is a means to an end. Right. And, and uh, one of the things I've been saying is, is you know, the fastest way for this, conflict to stop as Hamas to stack arms, march home and give up the uh, hostages, right? But they they don't want to. They have the will to fight. And so there is that competition of will. And so is it less grisly to just let Sherman go out and burn down cities and be like, this is what happens when you start a war with us? I, again, I'm not, I'm, look, I'm not promoting. Yeah, no, I, mind, but... say, I don't think so. I've gotten this question. Um, I think that you know, war is a contest of will and it is about using overwhelming force to achieve the goal as quick as possible. This is the idea, which I think is the road we're going down. Again, back to that Colin Gray statement. The more you try to limit the brutality of war, even beyond legal obligations, you're actually increasing destruction and death because you prolong the war, right? So this is the idea of the IDF have gone slow and methodical. And since Hamas is not going to surrender, it works into their strategy of just prolonging this until somebody says, you know, somebody like the United States says, look, I understand you have the right to defend yourself. I understand you had the right to retrieve your hostages, but you you need to stop. Um, because of the fact that they went slow and methodical and time is never unlimited in war. It never has been, never mm -hmm. will be. So this is why we developed maneuver warfare, right? One, you know, maneuver warfare is actually a cognitive, you know, if you're a maneuverist approach is that we want to cognitively defeat you as in you lose the will to fight because you, you view it as futile. One, how dare you? Like, like you said, like the deterrence is you believe I'm so strong, you won't do it. But then even in the execution of war, I'm going to come so fast and so hard that you, like I saw in the invasion of Iraq, of Iraq, you just walk away and blend back in. You you stop fighting. Um, yeah. Hamas, who's a terrorist organization, who literally their goal is death to achieve their grand strategy and the death of their people, which is unique, right? So it's not unique to use human shields. All terrorists do that. It's unique to have a strategy that relies on human sacrifice, as in they need mm. as many of their people to die so that they can achieve their political goal. So how are you going to methodic, you know, convince them that there's no use like that? You're not. You have to kill them. Yeah. I'm going to back us out a little bit and talk from another point of view, because I think this will help illustrate this a little bit. So uh, I had uh, Gills Milton and Halleck Kochansky. They both wrote about, so Halleck, she wrote about the resistance in all of like Europe. 
all of the resistances. And then Gills wrote about uh, Churchill's crazy bomb makers, the guy who invented the sticky bomb and all these different things. And so they would, they would do these special operations. This is for the audience. You probably know this stuff, but they would, you know, paratroop guys in with these uh, really in crazy invent. They're going to make a movie about this. It's fantastic. Anyhow, so um, they would go out and they would uh, attack the Peugeot factory or whatever it was in World War II. And that often led to the death of the operator, but also um, they figure out, the Germans would figure out that this thing came, emanated from this town, you know, whatever, Bath, St. Bath or whatever the town was. And the Nazis would go there and basically annihilate the town, you know? And so you, you think, oh my God, you know, this thing was meant to slow down the German machine so it wouldn't arrive to whatever place on time or whatever the, the, the operation was, but, Hey, the Nazis would target that town and just kill everybody in it because that's where the threat came from. So they're fighting their own form of war. That's horrible. But also, this is the fact of war is like we have to. These people are intermingled in the fight and they are, unfortunately, in that case, collateral damage because they've got to try these asymmetric ways of slowing down this big German machine. Indeed, I have to do that. Um, one, I think all war is asymmetric, period. Yeah, um, we we've kind of co-opted the word to mean different things: irregular, asymmetric. All war is asymmetric. Period. Um, if you're fighting your enemy symmetrically, doesn't matter if you have more power, then you're not doing it right. Um, right. You're, you should be developing asymmetric ways, like you said, even to not fight the enemy, fight what he needs to be able to fight, fight his resources. Yeah. I mean, right. why everybody quotes this guy who never existed, Sun Tzu, is because it is right to to attack your enemy strategy if that doesn't work attack his allies you know then try to attack his military and lastly attack his cities uh is literally mm -hmm. what the guy said but yeah asymmetrically like you have to outthink your enemy and to get to a point where he no longer thinks it's useful to resist and that could be his resources whether it's his his you know gas to ability to put in his tanks you know in, in the german yeah. uh, you know, to run out of the resources to reach their culmination point, their operational reach, all these things that are that we teach in our the halls of war colleges around the world. The uh, the department was Churchill's you know, uh, Department of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Even they knew what they were doing was you know not regular war, right? It was irregular and it did cost civilians lives. And if you were reporting this today. Be like, by the way, the town of, of oh, I don't know, Worcester, Mass, was just annihilated by enemy forces because a, a sabotage attack came from there. People would lose their minds. They would lose their minds. Meanwhile, the Brits would be like, we're trying to stop this giant war machine and from getting to whatever, right? Whatever that is, you know, the, the so, plant where all the black powder is. Yeah, it's interesting, Pete, since I've been talking about urban warfare for a long time to include in halls of, of great power. There has always been an assumption that, uh, yeah, John Spencer, you're probably right. But, you know, when the time comes, there will be a certain amount of destruction that is acceptable. Right. So, you know, below the nuclear threshold, you're saying that I need to be better at fighting in cities to reduce destruction. Right. I, I actually want to increase lethality so that you're faster at destroying the enemy in the city so he won't use the city. Not make you less lethal so the enemy has a greater advantage mm. and will be in cities more. But I used to get from very powerful people like, yeah, but if this is you know World War III, if this is a existential fight, a certain amount of destruction will be acceptable even under the laws of war because of the value. So that fast forwarded to that might not be the case. And that's what we're seeing yeah. in Israel, right? Israel, if you think that Israel is not in an existential war, then you're an idiot. Uh, if you think that Hamas on October 7th didn't have the intention of creating, destroying Israel, it wanted to go to Tel Aviv, it wanted to go to Jerusalem, it wanted Hezbollah to join, and Hezbollah did join. On October 8th, Hezbollah attacked in the north. It wanted the West Bank, Judea, and Samaria to uprise. It wanted to destroy Israel on October 7th. And it's, if you believe, but again, so going back to that rationale with some very powerful people that, yeah, when if this is an existential threat, you know, if this is World War III, a certain amount of level of destruction will be warranted. And so, John Spencer, your 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 warnings about us not being prepared for urban warfare won't matter 
we can just bomb our way out of it. And, and the world is showing all those people like that's not true. It's just that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. You've talked to a lot of people and I want to get into that a little bit because you have sat down with, well, we were talking about Michael Oren earlier and even within Israel politics, there's a, a push pull and, and Netanyahu's got to hold a, a parliament together. And so what, what is the vibe within Israel in terms of their will and, and their ability to get along? Because man, you know, here in America, we, we elect, we move left, we elect and move right. And then we just change our mind. And it's really tough for us to go see things through and, and, and be effective at the decisions we have to make to actually do the strategic and tactical things that allow us to win. So how is Israel doing with all that? I mean, I can't speak for Israel. You know, I'm, I'm not Israeli. I, I don't, right. I, I know a little about Israeli politics. I know about, um, you know, prime minister Netanyahu's history um, I can say from listening to them and being on the ground that much like we were after 9-11, they're unified. Um, mm -hmm. And the overwhelming, my personal opinions, um, is yeah. that Israel is unified and understands, and I guess the rest of the world doesn't, that they're in a currently in a war of survival, that right. the multiple nations are attacking. Iran is attacking through its proxies. Um Hezbollah, Hamas, the Houthis, they're attacking Israel. Um, and the, is the Israelis, to include 100,000 Israeli in a very small country who can't sleep in their own homes, understand, in, in my opinion, fully um, and are united. So this is the idea that if you switched out Netanyahu, something would be going on differently. Um, I think the strategy would be exactly the same. Unity in the country would be exactly the same. Um, yeah. And on my last trip, you know that I did sit down with – I mean, I, I didn't talk to him about politics. I, start, I talked to him about the strategy of the war. I sat down twice with Net, Prime Minister Netanyahu. I sat down with the, the, the chief of staff of the military, the right. southern commander. I sat down with brigade command, the division commander of the fight in, in central Gaza, brigade commanders, battalion commanders. And one thing that is constant across all of them was an understanding and a unified – approach to what the mission is they have to destroy the threat to their survival now there's some aspects of that can be political yeah. right like the northern sure. I mean, they, they absolutely want a political solution to hezbollah who is attacking and i went to the north um i didn't take a lot of pictures because for many reasons but i went to the northern israel to the blue line to to where a rocket had hit days before i got there um and i think the world is Tr not understanding the threat and the attack of Hezbollah in the north. Now they want a political outcome of that, right? Because there are four forms of national of, of a nation's power, right? There's diplomatic information, military and economic, and they're pursuing a diplomatic solution of Hezbollah stop attacking us back up to the agreed upon line while they're fighting a war of survival against Hamas. Yeah. Yeah. And, and meanwhile, here's Iran, constantly rattling its saber. And, and the thing I've been saying, and, and I'm, I'm prepared to be wrong about this, but Israel gets to believe Iran when it says it wants to, you know, drop nuclear bombs on them or eradicate them yeah. from the earth. And coupled with that is this enormous, enormous, like shocking level of anti-Israeli, anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's shocking the amount of people that just jump to the hate part of this and boy, so so I don't blame Israel. Like if everybody's offering this hate and this death and destruction annihilation, at some point, you know, they get to believe it. Yeah. And I, if you know the history, and I know you do, Israel has had yeah. to stand alone multiple times in its short history. I mean, the, yeah. the, the day it was given its sovereignty, it was attacked uh, right. in, in, the, in the War of Independence. And it has been attacked multiple times where the U.S. even said, like, you know, Yom Kippur War, like, yeah, we can help you a little bit, but um, it, it is surprisingly shocking uh, uh, that they've had to stand alone multiple times and they're willing to do it. But one of the greatest comments that have been made so far in this war that made me proud as, this, to, to, as an American, as an institute of war, is that when Blinken, um, it was not immediately after October 7th, but it was shortly after, said, you know, Israel has had to stand alone in its past and never will again. Yeah. And then you, know, you yeah. have to read through the politics 
of all of it, right? We're in an election yeah. year. You, you have to be very skilled to, and and you really don't know unless you're on those, whether it's a campaign team or whatever it yeah. is, what is being said for what reason and versus what's being done. But that comment made me proud as, as proud as uh, when Bush stood on the wreckage of 9-11 said, the people that knocked down these buildings will heal from all of us very soon. Uh, when America said we will stand with Israel and it's right to to exist, to defend itself, um, that does mean in direct support as in providing them with the arms to defend themselves. Yeah. 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 And, and if you, if you haven't, I'm, I'm sure you probably have, but if, if you're watching and you haven't uh, listened, go read some of Golda Meir's speeches. Yeah. You know, or the movie, about, even if you just want to watch oh the movie. <laughs> Yeah, that's, you know, I didn't think about that, but you're right. But yeah, her speeches and talking about how every single year of our existence, we have had a war every single year. Yeah. And when you hear that, it puts a lot of things into context like, hey, wait, someone does need to be on their side. And I'm glad that we are. Yeah. And and I'm also not against Palestinians, nope. but there has to be some kind of reckoning in there so that we can get on with getting on. And for right now, the hawks have to fly because... The doves, it didn't work, you know. You, so let's yeah, this is the crazy part is that how misinformed people is that you you can be pro-Israeli, you can be pro-Palestinian, and still right. be anti-Hamas, and still be anti-terrorist. Um, whether it's the Palestinian Authority or Hamas that are terrorists, yeah. in my opinion, with no affiliation. When you're talking to all these commanders in Israel, that's incredible access. Uh, yes. Is that their idea or, or how are you getting? I mean, that's incredible access. Like talking to a battalion commander, you got no business doing that. That means someone wants you there. Um, so one, my research in Israel didn't start with this war. So I have built up years of connections um, in studying their military. But also, I agree with you. It, uh, immense credibility. And like you said at the beginning of the show, I'm not pro anything. Okay. I research and try to bring understanding to the facts on the ground, whether that hap what happened in Kiev in 2022, in Nagorno-Karabakh in 2020, or what's happening in Gaza. That gets me some respect um, and it gets me some access. And I did write things early in this war where I saw the entire world going crazy on not understanding, not even acknowledging, even when Israel waited three weeks to evacuate a city, that that was a very good thing. So I was writing about that. And that led to, you know, I went in December. I went to the kibbutzes where October 7th happened. I wrote a Time Magazine article. It's crazy how, like, because the hate is so much that one ounce of the truth can, can be like, oh, I didn't know that. Like you, you didn't know that they targeted every, you know, 20 different areas, urban areas in Southern Israel and massacre. Like I saw the video, I went there in December and yeah, that led to that, that level of access, but also my, I have, you know, people think I just started about like, you know, I mean, I have 126 articles on urban warfare. I have a book. I have, I have two books. I wrote a book for Ukraine, as you know, uh, I have some street cred in not just giving access, right? Because they give they give people access, but but the fact that they know that with my access, I will have a better understanding of of what because of who I am, of what's actually happening. Where if you just bring a journalist, which has been crazy when they have let journalists, um, well, I cannot confirm or deny this is a tunnel. Like they're in a tunnel, and the <laughs> journalist says, I cannot confirm or deny this is a tunnel. Like oh. I've been in tunnels all around the world and I can go into a tunnel like like the one I was in in uh where it was a hundred meters outside of the the border between Israel and Gaza right next to the humanitarian crossing I can go into that and go this is an invasion tunnel it's the exact same tunnel that similarities to the North Korean tunnel that I was in along the North Korean and South Korean border right because of who I am and what I've studied I have the ability to translate for the rest of the world the things that I'm seeing with no affiliation or pro anything. 
there's that speed of combat that we unfortunately get used to, you know, and when you see that reporter from fill in the blank network and there is a bomb that goes off over a quarter mile away and they're like, Oh, <laughs> they disappear. I, I have no, they don't have any credibility with me. Right. Because they haven't, they don't know what they're looking at. And it's so shocking to the system. You know, you can walk through rubble and you're like, Mick, Lick, you know, whatever it's going to be, you know, like how these things happen, you know, you can look at the marks on the walls and know what kind of size ammo if you can see what happened in an area at a level that other people can't. And especially you with all of your travels through everywhere, all these different battles, you must have a clarity that does anybody else have that level of clarity that you see that goes out and does what you do? So I know of just the people who academically study urban warfare, I know them yeah. all personally and they and they all fit on one hand. Yeah. Uh, there are reasons to that. I mean, there, there are thousands of counterinsurgency experts, literally thousands PhDs in political sciences. Um, I know of one PhD who did his PhD in urban warfare that I've ever met in my life. And he did it on five battles and that was it. And then his PhD is done and he goes back to doing what he is. There is a, and this is what I do when I travel the world, as you know, and I've told you this, like the gap in the world is glow is urban warfare experts. Mm. And, and this war shows that because you have legitimately like very senior military people, very senior policy people making statements that make it very clear to me that they don't know the history of urban warfare. They don't know the history of this warfare. And Pete, as you know, as you traveled, even in Afghanistan, the practice of combat observers is gone. Yeah. Because the war has become more political. We used to send combat observers all around the world in our history. Even in our civil war, there were French, British, all kinds of observers with our units in the civil war. Yeah. Um, not partaking, observing. We used to yeah. send people into Japan during the Japanese-Chinese war, just observing. Um, that practice for political reasons has gone away. So how do we have an understanding of some aspects of war? There are reasons because military advisor became a mission creep into other things, you know, especially during the Vietnam war and all this stuff, but we've lost that insight to the actual mm. battlefield. Um, so I don't want to be so brash to say there's nobody like me. I can yeah. tell you that I have a lot of job security because if you want to be like me, um, you're about 10 years behind on just the academic study and right. the traveling into the world. I don't know of anybody else who has a mindset of learning from a battle who's been to been into the battles of Nagorno-Karabakh, been into the battles of Ukraine and into the battles of Gaza at this current moment. There might be somebody but he, if there is somebody in like a alphabet, you know, whatever agency, whatever, whatever, he isn't able to share his knowledge with the world. Yeah. Um, because I learned, like you said, you know, the definition of mastery, Pete, uh, mastery is a level of expertise where you have to have be teaching and conducting scholarship because that's a, in U.S. military definition, that's another level of mastery, a mastery if you can teach it. So I teach at the world's only course, and I can say that with full confidence, the world's only course for division level commanders and staffs on this exact type of warfare. Mm. Because I have to teach, I have to advance my expertise and my learning to that level of mastery in some aspects, because I think that's the challenge, right? If there's no, if, if all these things don't exist, it's going to be really hard to have but we're seeing the problem with that without that expertise. So if yeah. there's somebody like me, I don't know who he is. There's another thing within our um, within our academic uh, world, and I'm not as steeped in the academic stuff, but I've written peer-reviewed articles on the stuff I know about. And I, I, I wish I had um, a need to write more of them because there's plenty up in here, right? But um, you have to get paid, you have, you know, and that's not what I do. So one of the things I have uh, thought about long and hard is that there's a a concept that I believe exists called ethical saturation. And once you try to do everything right, you, you warp what's ethical into these non-ethical outcomes. And so the practice of being ethical in everything and taking on every initiative 
makes it so that you actually end up killing more civilians again. And so uh, I'll use some examples to kind of clarify what I'm talking about. Uh, you have a infantry combat patrol going off a of camp in Afghanistan. And they're like, by the way, if you see men raping boys, you need to deal with that. By the way, you're also going to go out and you're going to check on voting practices to make sure that you know, the elections are safe. By the way, you're going to go engage with the female population. By the way, by the way, by the way. By, and there's no professional mastery. There's no professional license to do any of this shit. Right. And so you you want you're desperate to help the farmers, but you don't even know what it is to be a farmer in Afghanistan. And I, I and I always use this example because it's so crystal clear when I say this. I'm talking to an American farmer who's a major. He's on an agricultural development team and he's trying to teach pomegranate farmers how to how to do a better job. And I said, what is the market chain from this dude to when it ends up in a bottle? He's like, I don't know. Like, well, then why are you fucking with it? Right. Because what happens is, is we make these bold assumptions that are wrong and what we think we're doing is right ends up not being right. So that's the concept of ethical saturation. And when we look at these things where we want everyone always to do the right thing in our mind, it was right and wrong. It, you end up with chaos and, and bad outcomes. I mean, I think I definitely understand all those examples that you gave, especially in our history and yeah. folly of building, uh, fighting counterinsurgencies for illegitimate governments um, yeah. and trying to build nations. Uh, I understand that, but there is in, in a profession, some underlying principles, um, like in the medical profession, do no harm. Right. Um, there is some underlying ethical, you know, and you, you've seen this where, you know, a commander who doesn't know what he's doing, um, you know, the can do attitude, he's trying with a set of principles of legitimately trying to help and not hurt the you know, this gets right. into the, I do believe there is good and evil in this world. I have seen evil firsthand. Um, this is why what I saw Hamas do was the worst kind of evil I've seen in my entire lifetime of studying war. Um, and I was at Bucha two weeks after it. Hamas is a unique type of evil who has in their internal, you know, from internal system to do harm, to do evil, uh, in where you have this other framework of a profession who has these underlying principles beyond all the laws of war, right? Because the law of war is right. actually to the, like the 1800s. It has fundamental principles, like the first principle of like, you know, do not target civilians. Right. And hold ourselves accountable. That's really one of the definitions of, account, uh, of a profession as well as self-accountability. So if we have a, a rogue soldier who goes off and kills a bunch of people and chopping off ears and things like that, like we're going to, we're going to to um, self-regulate and punish that person to to include up to the you know, death penalty. Um, yeah. So it, I understand the principle, and I hope you do more writing about it, Pete. Uh, yeah. Because I believe we, I learn. That's why I don't like the term expert. I'll use it if I need to. I'm a sure. student, and I'm in constant pursuit of learning in this very specific domain that I think is the future of war for many reasons. This is the yeah. domain of war. This, what we're seeing in Gaza, it, if the U.S. military doesn't believe what's going on in Gaza applies to them, then they're sadly mm -hmm. wrong on even this concept of that doesn't matter, you know, how many civilians you're going to kill in this operation. Like, yeah, but this I've done all these things. Yeah, but what's your number? Like, well, th right. that's not the way this works. Yeah, yeah. But what's your number? What's your combatant to civilian number that you think is going to happen or you just don't do the operation? That's where it's leading because I've studied this for long enough and seen it coming. And and unfortunately, it's a perfect storm because it's Israel, right? Like you said, the anti-Semitism, the history, the it doesn't matter what they say. They're lying. Uh, they're purposely doing like all. The, it's a perfect storm, but it actually yeah. applies to the to the rest of the world. Yeah, it sure does. And and I guess we haven't really covered this. So I want to ask you, uh, when does the politics stop? American Israeli politics stop and the actual initiative where, where is the line there and can you even tell you know because there's so much hatred toward netanyahu the prime minister um just because of who he is and his political leanings how do you how do you suss out when someone's able to be genuine about how they analyze this fight because and look you and i know we all know experts in the field or at students of our field and and we'll disagree rigorously about something and it turns out we can both be right and both be wrong at the same time and those things can switch and we'll be like oh didn't see that coming so so setting that aside a little bit um how much is politics in all this 
I mean, it's all politics. I mean, the the, mm. the entire framework of nation states is is politics. Um, it's through whether you're a democracy and autocrat, you know, uh, it's communism. It's all politics. How do you yeah. suss through in a war? What I tell people is watch what they do, not what they say, because yeah. the message of what they say, or even some of it's theater, um, because of the politics. And when you say politics, we're in a globally connected world and why the entire yeah. world is watching Israel. So the politics, what's said could be for a completely different audience that we're not even aware of that. That's the message. It's for that audience, that part that the calculation, the political calculations, um, but it's all politics. It never ends. Um, but watch what they do, not what they say. You know, I just realized I kept it for 10 extra minutes on accident. I was going to let you go early and you're so busy and I apologize. No uh, anything you want to say in closing before I let you get out of here? No, I appreciate what you're doing. Keep it up. And uh, I was happy to be able to join you again. Yeah, man. Thanks. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours truly.